what I've learned from you is this idea of a Magdalenian consciousness. So mm. you, you speak to the fact that the Magdalenian consciousness can provide healing to the intersecting to intersection of psyche, culture, and environment. Mm -hmm. So can you um, just explain a little bit what you mean by Magdalenian consciousness? Sure. So it, it kind of comes through this reimagining of the wasteland. So uh, do you mind if I segue into that first yeah, to that would be great. give a yeah. little background? Okay. Yeah. So um, as a Jungian and really a post-Jungian feminist scholar, um, one of the one of the key descriptive elements that really helped me understand um, the the danger of patriarchy is the concept of the wasteland. And the wasteland happens when um, we don't take care of ourselves, our communities, our planet. It can happen on all of those levels. And um, one of the really popular ways of looking at that right now is to notice how a logos-centered way of thinking, which is um, an arid, dry, perhaps masculinist, uh, disembodied way of you know, just using reason or Cartesian dualistic thinking to solve problems in, and denying the the feminine the embodied experience uh somatics um mythos the imaginal realm so it creates that that schism that split that that descartes promoted so what i started to think about in terms of the wasteland and i hadn't seen anybody else discuss this really was that it too was complex it wasn't just a feminine or a masculine wasteland or, or just a masculine wasteland had a feminine component as well. So um, generally, the wasteland is described as uh, desertified. So if we think about um, uh, environmental degradation, right? We we lose the ability to um, have fertile ground. It gets arid. There's no topsoil. There's no water, right? So that's the that's what I call the masculine wasteland that that has a um, another component to it because it's damned up right so if if in our masculine way of thinking we're not allowed to express emotion where does that emotion go where does that water element go and it's back behind a dam into what becomes a, a feminine bog and uh it's impossible to um get out of that swampy over emotive um stuckness it's a different kind of stuckness it's it's also not fertile, uh, more prone to mold and rot. So those two together, like how do we how do we take some of the lessons we've learned from environmentalism, right, and, and, and ecology, and um, mitigate the water flow in a new way? So when things go missing or are in exile, they tend to go underground. So if we look at a lot of the Magdalenian mythology, is about um, her story being. Uh, submerged and going underground to stay alive because it, you know heretics in Europe for example were all murdered because it wasn't you know it wasn't safe to go spouting Magdalene's story about uh, again whether true or not I mean it just wasn't safe to, to even talk about it um, so this returning of the feminine brings um, not just feminine qualities, but an honoring of the full spectrum again. And that consciousness helps irrigate the wasteland. And it's got to be done in conjunction with, um, you know, the, the, the types of things I advocate for are um, taking down the wall consciously and planting mitigating crops like willow trees and, um, uh, Steiner flow forms that uh, that help create and aerate the water. Um, so Magdalenian consciousness is about a wholeness and bringing that attention to our bodies, this ecosystem, the environment uh, that we create between people. You know, from a um, psychosocial level, socioeconomics. I mean, get, you can get into you know all levels of our 
uh, of how we are with each other and then certainly with the planet. Another long answer. <laughs> no, but that was that was great. I think I think too understanding that the divine feminine and that Magdalene as a representation of the divine feminine um, can be approached from all these different disciplines and mm -hmm. from all of these different um, I, I, like like you said earlier, it's it's holistic. So it's not just like a you know a semi historical or or maybe not historical, maybe historical woman from the, you know, Christian, early Christian era. Um, right. She's not just speaking to that kind of consciousness or that person. We're looking right. cosmically and here. Yes, yes. And as an interdisciplinary scholar and transdisciplinary scholar, that just means, you know, I want to deconstruct colonialism anywhere I see it or, you know, an imbalance of power. Um, it lends itself to examining a lot of different things. Like I mentioned economics. So if we're looking at the shared economy that's been developing um, and the gift economy that's been developing over the past and redeveloping and returning to old, older ways of sharing um, goods and services, that is very much in, in line with Magdalenian consciousness. Time banks, um, you know, it, it's, it's just fascinating to watch it unfold what's happened in the Me Too movement and Time's Up movement, of course, those are obvious examples, right, in terms of um, equal pay. Again, economics in terms of, you know, how are we doing, um, how are we sharing the things that we need in our, in our life? Exactly. Beautiful. Next, you finished the dedication of your dissertation with remembrance to Dr. Walter Odanyik. Is that how you say his last name? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I never met him in person, but I've heard oh. wonderful things about him. Um, so, and in the at, at the end, you say, uh, Dr. Walter Odinick, who understood that even if Magdalene never walked the earth, perhaps it was time we imagined her. Mm. So this really sets the tone of your dissertation, and I think speaks to the heart of Magdalenean consciousness that you just, you know, uh, elaborated for us. Um, mm -hmm. Could you again elaborate a bit more on why we would want to imagine her? Mm -hmm. Um, well, two things come to mind. One, my background in, in women's history, um, you know, was so much, it's, it's been so much about reclaiming these lost stories of, of women's lives, actual women's lives. Like, uh, right now, one, one that's finally getting a lot of airtime is Hedy Lamar as a, as an inventor. Um, you know, we thought, thought of her only as an actress and here she had invented the technology that makes cell phones possible right that makes what possible? so cell phones so you know these kinds of things like hidden figures uh about the women uh, mathematicians in nasa okay so as a historian um you know trying to find the the little shards of information that we have about her right wonderful wonderful place to start but um she can also be whether you know whether we are interested in um the archaeomythological evidence or not she can also be an opportunity to inspire and this this played out very um interestingly in um 2012 when a scrap of papyrus was handed in to Karen King who is an eminent um, Magdalene scholar at Harvard. And it was, uh, it mentioned Mary, wife of Jesus. And people were so excited about it because they were hungry, hungry for a rebalancing of the, um, of power and access to power, institutional, personal, all of the above. Um, and the Atlantic did a phenomenal job covering the discoveries as they went, they went through carbon dating. They did. I mean, they tested the ink, they tested the papyrus. Yes, the papyrus was old, but the data was earlier and blah, blah, blah. So this went on for a couple of years. And right as I was finishing um, my dissertation for submission 2016, so this is four years on, you know, I was tracking it the whole time. Um, they found out that it was indeed a forgery, but here's the thing. It caught the imaginal interest of, of, folks who were ready. And um, one of the writers from the Atlantic who did an exceptional job 
uh, researching this said, this is exactly the zeitgeist of the time. This is exactly what we want to believe, whether it's true or not, right? He was looking at it from a, you know, is it true or not? But for me as a, as a mythologist, I'm like, it doesn't matter. It gets us excited, it gets us talking about it. It's why Wonder Woman captures our imagination. You know, th- these, these opportunities to examine what if. Right, right. So I, I think that's going to lead me into a question I plan to ask later, but this is perfect timing. So I, like you, have spoken to the great healing that can come to women and men from remythologizing mm-hmm. Mary Magdalene. And this takes into account, as you mentioned, that an accurate historical account of Mary Magdalene is only part of the approach to bring about individual mm-hmm. and collective healing. When reapproaching Mary Magdalene, do you feel that it is possible to use both the accurate historical account and also what religious and feminist scholar Rita M. Gross calls a feminist useful past, a way to recreate or remythologize mm-hmm. female figures as empowering mythic role models? Yeah.